we're going to talk about interventions from key opinion leaders, regional viewpoints from Africa, Latin America, Asia, and Australia. Please welcome Professor Mu Ming Pu, who is the founding director from the Institute of Neuroscience of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. If we could not talk, please, to respect the panelists, thank you. Please uh, welcome Professor Mu Ming to the stage. We've also got Dr. Mahmoud Bukhar Mena, Independent Research Fellow, Serpil Sussex Neuroscience Team Leader, Biomedical Science Research and Training Center at the Yobe State University of Nigeria. And we've got Dr. George Barrero, Neuroscientist, the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Galway. And then finally, we have uh, Professor Michael Burke, who is the Alfred Deacon Professor and Director of the Impact Faculty of Health School of Medicine, Deakin University from Australia. So a lot of people who've traveled from lots of different places. If you could bring your chair a little bit more forward, then I'll be able to see you. So first of all, uh, I, I, well, who would like to go first? I would like you to start first because you've traveled such a long way. Oh, the longest way. <laughs> yes, probably the longest way. It's a yes, pleasure my, to have my, you with my us. My great pleasure. I, I want to introduce you uh, uh, first about the China Brain Project. As you know, in the last 10 years, there's a global wave at, at the government level that are aware of the importance of brain science and to the society. So they're beginning with the European Human Brain Project, followed by the Brain Initiative in the US and Brain and Mind Project in Japan. All this uh, 10 years ago, 2013. Now, uh, the second wave, right? So the human, human uh, Brain Project is following up by, by further, further extension. U.S. Brain Initiative has a 2.0 version. Uh, Japan Brain Mind Project has a Brain and Mind Beyond as a continuation. In China, uh, we have been discussing this all, almost uh, for 10 years, trying to make a plan that's really important, uh, useful to society. So finally, uh, in 2021, the China uh, Chinese government launched the China Brain Project, which I wanted to introduce briefly to you. This is a more comprehensive project with the center of the project on the basic neuroscience, uh, the neural circuit basis of brain function. Right? This is the problem uh, that we're talking about. We need to know the neural circuit basis of all different cognitive and behavior functions of the brain. That's the main body. Uh, the, the, uh, there are two wins of this project we call the apply win. On the one hand, there's a uh, study on the brain diseases, uh, the diagnosis and intervention of brain diseases based on large cohort of community cohort and patient cohort to collect enough data to develop effective uh, diagnostic tools and, and intervention tools. On the other side of applying, we have a, we call it a brain machine uh, intelligence technology. That would include um, brain machine interface, uh, neuromodulation tools, that's for the, uh, the neurotechnology that's applied to the brain, uh, to the brain disease, and, and also uh, brain-inspired technology, AI, and that includes uh, brain-inspired uh, uh, machine learning uh, algorithms and brain-inspired disease uh, devices, assistance, robotics, and uh, all this that could be applied also to um, uh, medical applications. And also, finally, the large data. Uh, that's really of concern for um, uh, the information we collect for large patient, large population uh, on the medical uh, data and, and the uh, uh, the effectiveness of uh, treatments, all this needs uh, uh, very uh, good methods for dealing with this large data. So that's a one body, two wins. That's the basic structure. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a modest uh, uh, investment by the government. It's 2.5 billion U uh, euros for 10 years. Right? If you calculate it, it's, a, it's probably equivalent to European projects, but one-tenth of what American is, is spending on brain science. But no, it's a much more clearly defined focus uh, program. We hope we will have some consequence. So that's the broad uh, scope. Then I want to talk about a little bit of the, uh, that relates to brain health issues, that uh, main focus of the present uh, discussion. 
we all know that the uh, brain disorder is uh, very difficult to treat. Once the patient reaches the final uh, stages, uh, basically it's helpless. There's no effective drugs. And it's all probably generally recognized. Early diagnosis and early intervention is the way to go. Now, we, if we can detect early signs, uh, good markers for disease, early we can use pharmacological or psychological, physical modulation tools to help to prevent the progression of disease. Now, this is come back to what Johan was talking about. The, what we need to do is to aim at a specific uh, neural circuits responsible for that particular symptom, right? In working memory loss, you aim at uh, memory circuits. Your motor system deficit, you aim at motor circuits. You don't aim your intervention, especially for a general early, early uh, uh, people with early signs. You don't want to put a label that you, are, you, have, you, are, you have dementia or you have depression. All these labels should not be put on. It should be a, a, a phenotype or functional based diagnosis by the, by, by, by this, uh, for this early diagnosis. And this is the program. This is not new. Uh, Tom Inso at MIH have this research domain criteria, which he wanted to promote 10, 10 years ago. He was promoting that in the US. But he was so disappointed that he couldn't get things moving. He left. He left the government. He went to industry to set up his own company, trying to do this uh, research domain monitoring of motions and was for, for disease diagnosis. But, but this is the, uh, what we, I think there's a room for this, especially uh, uh, that we have a need to really define what is the symptoms for, for disease. I talked about a comment a little bit earlier. Uh, that we need to, uh, a, a, a uh, large data sets for normal population, how, how, how it progresses with time. Right? For mental, mental disorders, we should look at uh, emotional status, or the memory uh, status, uh, and also including the many sensory modalities, and loss of vision, uh, hearing, olfactory, systems, they all can be monitored. Some of this has been used uh, aiming at a, a diagnosis of individual disease, and that has been with all the program well worked out. But those are all very effective in diagnosing the patient that already has a severe symptom that you can very reliably uh, predict they have problems. But are they good markers for early, early uh, diagnosis? They are brain imaging tools also in the same vein. Molecular markers in the bloodstream, in the CSF, those are being developed, but, but it still hasn't reached a stage we can say uh, this is a good biomarker. So I think uh, we are uh, trying to, at least in the brain disease area, to develop uh, a, a, a large population, data from large population of normal subjects of different ages from hopefully right now we are doing with adult patients. We have government workers who regularly go to the hospital uh, for, ch for checkup, health checkup, and now tens of thousands of in Shanghai just, just for that. We ask them to, to do a 30 minutes, uh, it's optional, a 30 minutes brain health checkup. And then we collect the data we're, we're the, for patients' uh, uh, benefit for their own, own uh, satisfaction, they will get a list of numbers. Uh, but, but we are tell them these numbers doesn't mean very much unless we know there's a large spectrum, in, uh, we get a normal curve. But in a few years, we can then gradually t inform them that your progression of your loss of your memory is more, uh, is abnormal. It's beyond one standard or two standard deviation from the mean. Then, then you should do something. Now here, I think the digital, digital technology comes in. We have so many apps that you can use. Now, that you, you will be encouraged to play a game that's, that helps your working memory. And if I was informed that I really have a problem with my working memory, I would be inclined to play that every day, just for, for, just, uh, just, for just like I t take the uh, sleep, uh, the, 
these uh, uh, blood pressure pills the same way. So but we, we, we will have to prevent the people having this problem uh, of uh, mental disease in their mind, that we are doing tests of my mental disease. That uh, stigma has to be, uh, it's going to be a barrier, right? So I think, uh, this, I think there's a good potential for that. In fact, I think in the post-COVID era, there's, uh, the brain science really has a, a, a responsibility, even more responsibility, to monitor the general population. What's the status of their brain, right? And AI technology is going to be much more helpful after, you know, in, in the near future, in developable, nice remote, remote uh, uh, tools, uh, wear, wearable uh, gadgets, you know, that can monitor continuously uh, people. It's going to be cheap. The, 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 the important criteria is this tool, brain health tool, uh, health uh, checkup tools, a toolkit we call, has to be uh, cheap and easy to use and widely can be uh, applied. That's the criteria. And we hope we can do that. Right? So that's, uh, you know, keep, keep to uh, tuning in the progress in China. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Uh, Mahmoud, we've heard from you earlier today, but uh, now talk about your subject area. Um, I think for me, one thing that I would like to start with is to point the fact that genetic studies suggest that we are all Africans deep down in our DNA. <laughs> yeah. And um, for that reason, understanding African biology is so critical for understanding our history as well as how we work in health and a disease, you know. But we've heard about, sorry, we've heard about all these different projects, you know, in China, in Europe, in all these different places. Unfortunately, no news is coming from Africa. Um, in the last seven, eight years, what we've been trying to do as a community is to understand what are the opportunities out there in Africa? What are the strengths that the African neuroscience community has? And we, what are the challenges? Obviously, because you could argue that, you know what, I should focus on my population, European population, American population, you know, uh, Brazilian population. So as a community, we thought that the base approach to sell the African neuroscience is to come up with value proposition. I co-chaired a two years engagement supported by the Wellcome Trust during which we worked with different neuroscience societies in Africa as you know, from early career to senior career researchers. And through that, we identified five different domains of distinction. And in the interest of time, I'm probably just going to talk about two. One of these is obviously the genetic diversity in Africa. And that is so, so critical for understanding brain health. So as an example, for example, the biggest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease in the European and Asian population is for if for Alil. However, in the African population, that is not a significant risk factor. And we know that based on GWAS studies, there are a lot of evidences suggesting that uh, some risk factors within the African population are not necessarily the same in the European or Asian population. So that is an opportunity for us perhaps to dip in to understand what could be some protective rigs alleles that we can now use towards global breakthrough in brain research. Second aspect could be the diversity in African flora, fauna and ecosystem. In Africa, there are a lot of medicinal plants which would potentially open ways for drug discovery. In the area of, you know, there are a lot of animal models as well, spiny mouse, you know, which is an excellent model for studying spinal cord regeneration, you know. Uh, naked mole rat that is being used also widely. They are all African models, and there are a lot of models that have not been studied yet. Now, if we go, if I could go on and on to talk about all the opportunities that African neuroscience you know, can give to global brain research. But then the thing is, if these opportunities are existing, how comes or what is stopping the African neuroscience from utilizing that? And this brings me to the barriers. So again, I've led a study over the last 34 years where we analyzed thousands of, uh, you know, data uh, on the last 20 years of African neuroscience in order to identify the key 
you know, barriers, opportunities, trends, etc. And one of the key barriers that came up is the lack of infrastructure. What I mean here is that equipment, for example, for doing research. And in this situation, what we did was we specifically ensured that the thousands of articles that we analyzed actually were conducted within Africa. It doesn't mean, for example, I'm in the UK, you know, doing research and I put my African affiliation. No, we rule out all papers that had affiliations outside Africa. And based on that, you know, we could see that across the continent there are only a few hotspots where, for example, equipment like confocal microscope is being used, you know, you know, clinical imaging equipment, PET scan, you know, it's not something that is widely available. So there's so much heterogeneity in access to this equipment. And obviously that is stopping African neuroscience from kind of taking full advantage of the opportunities out there, you know. And you could argue that obviously funding is a major issue, but having said what I've said earlier in terms of the diversity and everything in Africa, I think it's in our interest, the global neuroscience community, to support research beyond, you know, uh, without thinking of borders. Now I would like to end by thinking about what do we need to do next. I have one or two uh, or three key points to mention <laughs> quickly. <laughs> the first thing is, um, I think uh, to support African neuroscience to, uh, you know, uh, which is obviously supporting global brain research, we should think about community-based approach where, you know, either collaborators, funders, or other forces outside Africa should support African style neuroscience societies or laboratories to produce a hub or to, you know, to have a hub model where they are able to engage with local researchers, knowing well their cultural and lived experiences, thereby mentoring them well to become, you know, next generation of leaders that can drive research within the continent. Secondly, also, I know that there are a lot of opportunities where people go on to study master's, PhD, postdoctoral outside Africa. But one of the key things that should happen is to have, Ibro is doing that, return home, return home fellowship, even though the return home fellowship isn't really, you need to increase the budget. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. So, 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 you know, those kind of, uh, you know, uh, approaches are so, so important because when you have the African community, you can't really, you know, work on, an African problem outside Africa, unless you have the affiliation or you are down there. And without a laboratory to do with the equipment, without the equipment, you can't really do that. And finally, I promise you this is the final one. <laughs> um, and finally, uh, obviously, I think uh, funders and uh, other great big associations should think about multinational, uh, you know, collaborative projects where African based angle of the research should be led by African. You know, you know give them the leader role. Why, why that is really important is if you have, let's say, a project between the EU and Africa, and you have an African-led investigator leading that, that gives them the exposure, that gives them the opportunity to now use the resources to you know, really build better resources beyond that research that they are conducting. And eventually, that is good for the global uh, scientific community. And of course, also know about the heterogeneity across the continent. Support for South Africa would be minimal, perhaps compared to support for Nigeria or other places. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think there's a fine line between science and politics here, actually. I think you have another career up your sleeve. You've also traveled a very long way, Michael. We're grateful to have you here from Australia. So let me tell you a little bit about the situation in Australia. Australia in some ways is doing extremely well and in some ways is struggling. So where Australia is doing really well is the extent to which mental health, brain health is a public policy priority. So the, our latest census came out and was really trumpeted that mental health has now trumped all other disorders as the dominant cause of disability in Australia. Our, politici our politicians take this seriously. So if you look at election priorities, mental health is number three, four, five, depending on the year. But it's always a top 10 election priority. The good news is that the government's throwing a huge amount of money at it, which is wonderful. So my own little service has probably increased in the two decades I've worked there, a factor of five to 10 fold 
So we have got 10 times more clinicians working in the service than we had 10 years ago. The problem is that they haven't invested in capacity generation as much as they've invested in posts. So what this has led to is a uh, conga line of piranhas each eating each other's tails. So there's massive competition between services from staff, and all this is doing is increasing the churn of people jumping from service to service, which has not been terribly helpful. So one of the challenges for us is to massively increase the capacity, both of researchers, particularly clinical academics, and uh, clinical staff. We are way behind in meeting the staffing needs that we require. The other characteristic where, where things have really changed, and I think Australia is doing quite well, is the extent to which clinical research priorities are now consumer-led. So we have a new, our government is investing in, at least in the state that I'm in, uh, in what they're calling the Victorian Collaborative Centre for Mental Health and Wellbeing. So this is a $1 billion infrastructure investment in a clinical academic research structure, and it's co-led by consumers and clinicians. Uh, consumer priorities are foremount. You can't get a research project funded unless you have a consumer advisor on your team. Uh, that is a big change in the way things are working, and I say all strength to your elbow in that one. I think that's a really important and productive change. Um, I'm also very much aware that if you look at consumer surveys of their needs, and again, forgive me for taking um, mental health focus on this, but number one on most consumer needs is getting better. They want better treatments, effective treatments. And <coughs> we really struggle in the mental health space with a drought in our treatment development pipeline. Uh, there is a real crisis in terms of this. We've been working very hard in developing alternative pathways to bypass the lack of basic known pathophysiology of these disorders using reverse engineering. Um, so we take patient-derived stem cells and we reverse engineer using transcriptomics and other omics to both see how we can repurpose medications that uh, firstly capture what known medications do in terms of transcriptomics and, and messenger RNAs, and secondly, how you can, trans how you can use um, repurposed medications to, uh, tr to transmute a patient phenotype into a control phenotype. So we think that there are ways to bypass this drought in treatment discovery, but I still think this is the major gap for us. But in doing so, there are a couple of other priorities that I think are terribly important. The first is we need transdisciplinary approaches. What, what Harris wrote about in his book on convergence mental health. Uh, the field is too complicated for anybody in one silo to deal with. We need economists, we need physiologists, we need data scientists. We, need, we work very closely with cardiologists and intensive care physicians because there's an enormous amount we can learn from them, particularly at the systems level in terms of managing the challenges organizationally, structurally, uh, and collaboration-wise. So th I think that is a very important issue for the field. We also need to mount large-scale research initiatives akin to those that are routine in cardiology and oncology. It's normal in oncology, in cardiology, to have trials of 20,000 people. It's normal in psychiatry to have a trial of 123 people, and <laughs> you, don't, you, you get statistical significance of 0.07, and then you say it's a failed trial. We have to stop doing this. In order to do this, we need to collaborate and even within Australia, it's too small. Uh, I've, I have the privilege of leading Magnet, which is a government-funded national clinical trial network, where we're trying to pull together people across the country to prioritize trials of the identified priority areas. But Australia is too small for that. We need to be thinking nationally, uh, internationally. Uh, we have this in other disciplines. The neurologists do this, the cardiologists do this, the oncologists do this we can launch large-scale international trials of scale, power, and gravity that will definitively answer the critical issues for our field. We need international clinical trial networks that 
will recruit a diversity of patient populations and have the power to be able to come up with definitive answers. The last thing I want to mention is to pick up on a point that Teo mentioned in his conclusion, which is also a point that was raised by The Economist about five years ago, which made the point that mental health is an economic best buy. We live in a brain economy where capital and cognitive skills are paramount to our future as a, as a race, as a nationality, as a humanity. We have to, um, we have to invest in brain capital and we have to look at common risk factors that are targetable and plastic. Uh, there's, not, there's a huge number of risk factors you identified 97. I've seen other reviews. Ken Kendler says there's 37 risk, whatever it is. But not all of them are plastic. Many of them are environmental, and we need to prioritize those. The second thing that we need to prioritize is we need to be looking at those factors. If we're looking at, we, we're going to have to deal with public health policy approaches because the model of individual motivational change does not work. We have to be looking at Public policy approaches, we need food taxes, we need bans on junk food advertising, we need urban design that prioritizes bicycles as opposed to cars. We need, that's how we're going to change exercise, that's how we're going to change diet. We have to change the food environment. In order to do that, we need to work not just as brain scientists, we need to work with cardiologists and oncologists and diabetologists because the risk factors are the same. But I'll be a little bit cheeky here in suggesting that if you want to change behavior by getting, you want to prevent bowel cancer, to tell a 20-year-old to change their diet because it might change the risk of bowel ba cancer when they're 60, you're going to have no cut through. But if you can tell a 20-year-old you'll feel better tomorrow if you change your diet, if you exercise, if you stop smoking, you got a chance of cut through. So I think mental health is the arrowhead of a transdisciplinary pr prevention and promotion health category, with the end point being across the non-communicable disorders. I mean, that's a big vision, but I think that's what we have to aspire towards. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> well, George, to wrap it all up, you represent well, South but America. Not least. Last but definitely not least, <laughs> South America brought to us from the University of Limerick in Ireland, right. no less. It's not, I'm not coming far, far away, actually. Uh, this was just one hour and a half flight. Um, yeah, so I, I, being a part of Ebro, for example, uh, so I'm an Ebro LARC member. So that means that uh, in also being around for such a long time, actually, uh, I've been living in so different many countries. So that gave me the experience of you know, getting the knowledge, getting the reality of different countries in terms of education and training opportunities in different, in, in those areas. So I think that speaking about Latin America, I think that speaking about my home country. So I would say that we have some difficulties, we have some lack of funding. I think funding has been mentioned so many times right here. So uh, I will try to go over that in a deeper way. So uh, just to give you some data on that, actually just 1% of the gross income is, is spent in, uh, in science. And taking into account that only 1% of that income is brought to science, actually, we just need to ask ourselves how much is that going to be applied, actually, to, uh, to communities, to local communities, how is that going to be successfully uh, reach any, uh, uh, any outcome that could be a positive outcome. So I think that most of the funding uh, uh, in South America is not distributed equally. So I think that one of the problems that we have is that how we can distribute the resources equally. So one point is that um, it, there is a lack of data transparency and actually uh, um, surveys that might give us the idea of what each region needs actually, so, so we can distribute uh, the funds uh, uh, equally. The next one is the brain drain. I think that uh, people are not happy with the situation in South America, so they will just migrate. So that migration process is quite uh, traumatic to them. Not only important of that, that would lead also that female underrepresentation in science. So I think that in South America, the policies to, for equity, for um, diversity and inclusion, it's not pretty much advanced. So that means that um, 
women are underrepresented in influential positions. So I think that we need to change that a lot. Let me give you just one uh, uh, recent example. So I was talking with some um, a, a colleague. So we were applying for promotion actually, and. Um, and I asked, are you not going to apply for promotion? Because uh, she said no. And I said, why not? Because you can you meet the criteria for that. So there were probably three criteria. She, she just met two criteria. And one thing that I normally see in women uh, trying to promote, to get promoted or apply for positions, for example, that if it, they do not met all the criteria, they will not apply. So male, uh, male and neuroscientists, they don't care. Actually, they will apply anyway. So uh, they might get the position. So women, in order to apply for those promotions and, and, and um, positions, they meet all the criteria. Otherwise, they will not apply. So and that's really sad. So in the end, so uh, she applied and she got promoted. So um, I think that female neuroscientists are struggling, struggling harder than male neuroscientists in, in Latin America because of the lack of policy and funding as well. So one thing that's really important is to get to know what the needs of South America in terms of funding, how we can distribute the allocation or allocate the funds uh, correctly. One problem as well that we see, uh, like, like I mentioned my colleague here, is that uh, uh, South America and also uh, uh, Africa is pretty much alike in terms of um, um, governments, priorities uh, and policies and so on. We know that the government will change every and often, but the politics in science will also change. And depend on the financial crisis, for example, that will change likely as well. So that means that the science budget could be allocated different according to you know every three or four years. So there are a few ways that we can try to mitigate some of those damages uh, in Latin America. So one is just to promote better policies and apply the fund in a better way according to the needs because you know the fund will be mostly allocated to research-led universities in big capitals. So we need to get to know the reality in different areas from far away from the capital as well. So I know we know that Latin America people, neuroscientists, they struggle a lot to pay APCs, for example, for publication articles, because we know that sometimes the fees could be quite high, because that could be probably three, four times higher the salary, the monthly salary. So I think that's, uh, we need, that we need to build some ways in order to try to mitigate that damage to lack of funding as well. And I think that there is a very important language barrier in Latin America, and that may stop it then, um, like for example, presenting uh, in Congress, communicating better, building new partnerships, because at Latin America, we have a lot of brilliant neuroscientists, but we need to know better how to, we can communicate the science that we do there. Um, so one thing that we could do is, again, just to reduce the APCs, just improve the training uh, in, for South American people, for minorities as well, because we know the minorities will struggle much harder than other people. Uh, I think that's getting to know what the needs of each country, so we can try to mitigate that damage in a very good way. Fighting against the language barrier, I think that's really important, especially that we will avoid you to make a good collaboration with abroad groups or with the groups abroad. So. I think that publishing, for example, your papers, your results in local communities, engage more with policymakers and advocate. Just embrace your science that you do in Latin America. I think that's important for you to make it visible to the world. I think that's my main key is here. Thank you so much, George. Thank you.